The Bible says these words, Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Let's get that again. Here's thanksgiving. Now, thanks be unto God. All right, what are we thanking God for here? Which always causeth us to triumph. Well, how does he do that? In Christ. Let's talk again tonight about triumphant in Christ. Uh, honestly, ladies and gentlemen, that's an awesome word, isn't it? Victory, triumph, I won. I, I just like the sound of that, don't you? I won. Uh, there's something special about that. Are y'all with me on that? You agree with that, don't you? There's a special word there. That's an incredible word. Uh, there's a victory in sports. How many of y'all are, are uh, Browns fans? Anybody here a Browns fan? How many of y'all were happy today? Are y'all happy tonight? Uh, I thought you probably would be. That uh, could have gone the other way, and we're happy they won because that helped our spirit in the service, didn't it? And there's just something great about winning. We like to win. Uh, we like a hard-fought game. Don't you like that? How many of you have seen that uh, Christian film? I say film rather than movie because I'm a fundamental Baptist. Uh, how many of you have seen the Christian film Facing the Giants? Have you seen that? And how many of y'all know that one scene where the guy's carrying the other guy down the football field and the coach is yelling, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. How many of y'all recognize that? Do you recognize that? That's an awesome scene, isn't it? Because there's something about winning that always just thrills our heart. Sometimes there's just victory and finishing, isn't there? Like how many of you ever took algebra? Let me see your hand. If you ever had algebra, how many of y'all praise God you finished that and you're done with it? Any, any amens on that? How many of y'all ever took geometry? Any, any geometry takers? How many of y'all praise God that's over? Y'all happy about that? How many of y'all like geometry just out of curiosity? Wow, quite a few uh, weird and odd people. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I liked it too. It was one of my favorite classes, weirdly enough. Uh, how many of y'all like literature? Your literature is my thing. How many of y'all not on your life? Give me algebra any day. Anybody like that? Yeah, there's a few of us that way. There's just something about, special about finishing, about, about winning. Bethley's family had a friend of the family. They called him uncle. He wasn't technically uncle, but he was close enough to her dad. He was uncle. And some of you might even know him. He was an evangelist named Phil Schuler. Uh, anybody here know that name, Evangelist Phil Schuler? Some of you do. He was Uncle Phil to Bethley. And years ago, I remember when I was in Bible college, Uncle Phil came to chapel at Pensacola Christian College, and he spoke in chapel. And, and I remember he told the student body, and it really caught me off guard. It really it startled me a little bit. He said, you know, students, he said, the day I got married was the only time my dad ever gave me any advice about being married. It was right before the wedding. He said, we were on the platform, you know, back there in the room waiting to go out. And he said, my dad was going to do the wedding. Dad was marrying us. And he said, dad, you know, he's back there with me. And my dad was kind of quiet in relation to these kind of things. And my dad, just before we went out, my dad, he said, turn around. And dad said, now, Phil, I'm going to give you one piece of advice before we go out there. And he said, I was all ears because dad gave no advice. Nothing had ever been said to me until this moment. And I thought, what is dad going to say to give me great advice about being married? And I remember Uncle Phil, he grabbed his lapels like this, and he said, dad grabbed my lapels, and he pulled me close, and he said, son, you listen to me, and you listen well. When you have your first fight, you win it. <laughs> it was like, where did that come from? I remember as a college student thinking, well, well, okay, that's, I, guess, I guess that's advice. I don't know if it's good or not, but it is advice. But it does remind me, I like to win, don't you? All of us ought to desire to have victory in Jesus Christ. So here's our outline to lay the foundation for our series. Number one, it's assumed. Y'all with me on that one? It's assumed. So it's just like God says, hey, y'all, hey, y'all, I just want you to know something. My plan for your life is that you have victory. It's just a suit. It's like it's a done deal. He says it in such a way as if you've already experienced it. Isn't that incredible? So, so somebody says, well, I don't know if I have a lot of victory or not. I, I get down pretty easily and get frustrated pretty easily. And I, I feel like there's so many things I could do better. But here's what God says. He looks at you and says, hey, I just want you all to know something. You are triumphant in Christ. It's assumed. Remember the second point? It's accomplished in Christ. So that's what he says here. Now, thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph. And then he adds these two words. It's in Christ. Remember, church, it's not your strength. It's not your ability. It's not your education. 
It's not how long you've been saved. Don't, don't, don't you, how many of you have been saved a long time? Are, are you like that? How many are like that with me? You've been saved a long time. Isn't it true that after you've been saved a long time, you get to the place where you start thinking, you know what, I'm good. I mean, for crying out loud, I've been in church all my life. I know when to stand up, when to sit down, when to say amen, when not to say amen. In fact, I just, I just pretty much, I pastor announces a text and I'm like, you know, I, I remember that text. I, I'm doing pretty good. Don't, don't we get there? Y'all Yo, get there, don't you? And yet, if you're not careful, you can get to the place in your life where you can start thinking like this. Well, you know, praise God, praise God, I'm telling you, I'm good. I've arrived. I'm so spiritual, it's shocking to everybody, I'm sure. But what Paul is trying to remind the church at Corinth here is that this great man, the Apostle Paul, he wasn't any better than anybody else. Apart from Jesus Christ, he's an absolute failure. That's what he's wanting you to know. Don't ever forget that. You won't, you'll never be saved long enough to have victory on your own. You ever tried it? You ever thought, I, I, I'm, I've, I've been saved so long, I don't even need to pray anymore. Try it. See how that works out for you. I, I'm telling you, I, just, I know so much Bible, if I never read any more verses at all, I, I probably would be fine. Now, we wouldn't say something like that. We would, we, there's no way. There's no way I'd do that and say that. Neither, neither would you. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes in our spirit and our, our just complacency and our casualness and our coldness, sometimes we can come to that place where, you know, really, we're, we're good. We go to church. We tithe. You know, I, I give. I, you know, I sing. I'm in the choir. I even help in the buses. But the fact of the matter is, we stopped growing. We're not on fire anymore. We're not experiencing that red-hot victory that God wants us to have. How long has it been since you really lived in victory? I mean, really had the joy of the Lord, and you were on fire for God, and you were just always well in your life. Man, you were just, you were just blessed by God. You, you had the joy, the love, the peace of God. You, you were easy to get along with. Everything was great. I mean, you were just really on fire for God. How long has that been in your life? Here's what he's talking about. You can't do it. It's assumed, but it's accomplished in Christ. And our third lesson we're learning from this verse is simply this, and it's very simple. It's not automatic. God's plan for me and you is that we triumph in Christ. It's not automatic. And so we learned this morning, th uh, three things really. We learned this morning that number one, we've got we've to know our standing. Y'all remember that from this morning? And then we learn that you got to settle your salvation. And let's just mention that again. Nobody goes to heaven because they go to church. Is that right or wrong? You don't go to heaven because you've been baptized, right or wrong? That's right. Uh, you, you don't go to heaven because you're a church member or you're a good dad or a good mom. You've got to be born again through Jesus Christ who died for our sins and was buried and was raised from the dead. And you know, it's Sunday night. It's Sunday night. And probably it, because it's Sunday night, most of you, uh, maybe all of you, you're born again. You're on your way to heaven. But I wouldn't take that for granted. Anybody here tonight? And the fact is, you're not a Christian. You're not saved. You're not born again. I mean, you know about God. Maybe you didn't believe the Bible. You celebrate Christmas, maybe you celebrate Easter, but the fact of the matter is, you can't point to the time in your life when you humbled yourself, you confessed you were a sinner, you admitted that God was right about you, that you were on the road to hell. You don't know the time in your life when you turned to Jesus, you believed on Jesus, you trusted in Jesus, you, you, you called on Jesus Christ, and he saved you from sin and hell and changed your life. See, if that's never happened in your life, it's got to start there. You got to be born again. Well, listen, teenager, if you keep putting that off, stop. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Trust in Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Call on Jesus. Believe on Jesus. He's a wonderful Savior. How many identify with that? Man, he's a wonderful Savior. Aren't you glad you got saved? I got peace in my heart and, and, and joy in my soul and forgiveness for my sins. I'm just, I'm on the way to heaven and I thank God for that. You ought to be saved if you don't know Christ. It's a wonderful thing. So you got to know your standing. You got to settle your salvation. And the fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, you got to take steps. It's not automatic. Victory is not automatic. Unless you are taking spiritual steps, you will not enjoy the victory God has for you. So let's talk about one big one tonight, all right? Let's talk tonight about spiritual growth. How many of y'all agree that growing is a good thing? Y'all agree with that? You know, we got five kids and when we had uh, Abigail, she was this tiny little thing. She was so petite, I felt awkward holding her. She was so tiny. And, and 14 months later, Josh was born, and he was the exact opposite. Abby was this little, tiny, petite, little thing. Our son was born, he was half grown. 
And I remember when I went in to see him and I first saw him and I was like, wow, that's a big difference from his sister. And uh, it wasn't long until they were about the same size in a double stroller. How many of y'all know about those? And the next thing you know, people thought, you know, wow, here's twins. And people would say things like this to us. I always got a kick out of it. People will say the funniest things to you, won't they? And people would say to us, they'd say, oh, my soul, you have a boy and a girl and now you guys are done. <laughs> like, well, you know, that's kind of a, uh, we'll decide that, okay? Uh, you know, but, but I, I guess you know, it's just kind of a weird thing to say. How do you know we're done? We want 10. I mean, might as well shock people while you're at it. And uh, we're going to have, we're going to beat the Duggars. I mean, might as well go all out. <laughs> and uh, we're not, but you know, why not? Help your church to grow. And, uh, but <laughs> people, people would come by and they'd see Ch Charity and, J or, um, rather Abby and Josh in the stroller. And, and sometimes they'd say something like this. Oh my word, your kids are so cute. Well, we knew that, you know, we're, we're the parents. Oh, your kids are so cute. And then they'd say something like this. Don't you wish they could stay babies all their life? Are you kidding me? Help me out here, church. Good heavens, no. I love the babies. Bring them on. I'm, 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 I'm ready. I'm ready. I got three kids married. How many of y'all think I need grandchildren? Don't y'all think that? Yes, see, my wife in the spirit right there. We're ready. Bring it on. I just, I'm praying, waiting, praying, waiting, talking to God about it, and maybe talking to the kids about it. You know, hey, I spent a lot of money on those weddings. Let's get with the program, all right? And y'all with me on this? People say, oh my goodness, don't you wish they could stay babies the rest of No, no. Growing up is a good thing, isn't it? When I was a little boy, the earliest memory I have, this is so weird, the earliest memory I have uh, involved several things, and one was my sister. Uh, I don't know, I was probably two or three, something like that. I remember my sister had a problem when I was a kid, and the problem was that she liked to bite things, namely me. <laughs> I don't know how many times my sister took a hunk out of me. I just, argh, just ripped me up good, you know. And I'd run to my mom, squalling my head, oh, she bit me, and my sister would get in trouble. And I don't know how many times that happened. And I remember one day my mom in frustration. I don't recommend handling it this way. But mom was frustrated, I think. And here's, you know what my mom said? My sister bit me, got in trouble, and my mom was so frustrated. My mom said, for crying out loud, son, bite her back. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best way to handle this or not. And the fact of the matter is, I never did it. And the reason I never did it is because she was older and she's a girl. And how many of y'all know, girls don't fight fair. <laughs> Especially if they're your sister. Y'all with me on that? So I never bit her back. I remember also around that same time, I had this problem. When I started talking, I had a speech impediment. And, and I really did. I, I had to go to speech therapy. I took several speech therapy classes and my elementary school to correct my speech impediment. And, and it was a weird speech impediment. I remember it just a little bit. And, and it, was, it was so weird. I said all of my T's as if they were F's and all of my F's as if they were T's. And my parents must have a warped sense of humor because you know what they did? They got me a dog. And they named it Little Feller. <laughs> now, is that an unkind thing to do with a kid who has a speech impediment with his T's and his F's? I look back and they, what were my parents doing to me? So my dog, Liffleteller, uh, I love that little dog, Liffleteller, and um, Liffleteller and I, I, mean, I was just a little boy. I was just little. I can barely remember this, but I remember, I remember my sister biting me. I remember my little dog, Liffleteller. I remember that, and I remember one day we were out on the porch playing. My little dog and I were playing on the porch in our little home there in, in, in East Tennessee, and I remember this very clearly. You know what my dog did? My dog bit me. <laughs> and I remember this very clearly. I was infuriated. My sister bites me and now my dog does and I heard my mom's voice in my heart my mom said bite him back and I kid you not I remember this very clearly I took that little dog behind the neck and I grabbed the little dog on the hindquarters and I picked him right up off the ground and I took a hunk out of him I bit that little dog pretty good and the little dog was like Arr! And I remember my mom, I, I was so proud of myself. And my mom came to the door and she's like, what'd you do to that dog? And I was so proud, I was like, mom, my, my dog bit me and I bit it back. 
And I think that's when my mom first started wondering about my uh, intelligence. <laughs> I just, I just got to tell you, I'm glad I grew up. Amen. I'm glad I lost that speech impediment. How many of y'all praise God? Wouldn't you hate to hear a guy speaking with, with an impediment like that? I would have been, I'm so glad I grew up. I'm older now. Growing up is a good thing. How many of y'all, you young folks, how many of y'all looking forward to growing up and getting a driver's license? How many, how many kids in the room like that? Can't wait to get a driver's license. Raise it high. Can't wait to get a driver's license. Hey, we've seen some of you walk. Mm. Can't imagine you driving. Help me out here. Growing up, we all want it. You know what the Bible wants you to know? Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to have victory in Christ, if you're going to absolutely enjoy this triumphant life, you know what you got to do? you got to grow spiritually. And here's what you'll think if you're not careful. Hey, come on, brother. Dave, I've been saved for 45 years. I'm just telling you right now, I know a lot more than I did when I got saved. Well, I hope you do. But you know, you're never to stop growing. You're never to stop growing. So how do we grow spiritually? You got your Bible? You got a Bible? Let's look at a passage tonight, and our time will be gone. Look at Psalm 119 with me, would you? Psalm 119, find it. In a moment, we're going to stand and read the entire psalm together. I, I was joking. And if some of you have no idea why people are laughing, it's because Psalm 119 has 176 verses. And as a preacher, it's always been one of my secret desires to do that. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word and read Psalm 119. Wouldn't that be incredible? <laughs> Maybe one night we will. That'd be just a blessing to everybody. Let's start in Psalm 119, verse 1. We won't read it all tonight, but notice a couple of things. Psalm 119, verse 1. What's the first word? Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with a whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Watch verse 5. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like verse 5? Man, I wish I were a better soul winner. You ever feel that way? Man, I wish I were a better dad. You ever feel that way? Man, I wish I were a better mom. I wish I were, I wish I were a better prayer warrior. You're not alone in that. You're not alone. Because here's what the psalmist said. He said, you know what? Blessed is the man. Blessed man. You can have God's blessings all over your life. And then he adds at the end of it like this. Oh, he said, man, I wish my ways were always directed to do what I ought to be doing. Yeah. See, we're not alone tonight in the fact that we need revival. We're not alone in the fact that sometimes we've got to stop and say, okay, God, where is it that I've gotten complacent and casual and maybe carnal? Lord, where is it that I've just stopped growing and I've gotten comfortable with where I am and I really don't need revival? I'm okay. I, I'm okay with being a grouch box. Or I'm okay with being irritated all the time. I'm okay with being on edge. I'm okay with the fact that I, I seldom see anybody saved anymore. I'm okay with the fact that I don't remember the last time I brought somebody to church in hopes that they would get saved. You know, I'm, 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 I'm okay. I, no, we don't have devotions much anymore in our family, but I'm, I'm, I'm okay. It's so easy to get there. And yet David's heart is the heart we need. Oh Lord, how I wish that my ways were directed to keep your word. That's what he's saying here. What's he talking about? I got to keep growing, Lord. I got to keep growing. How many of y'all want the blessings of God in your life? Do you want that? I do. Man, I, I want God's blessings in my life. I want God's blessings in our marriage. I want God's blessings in our children. I want God's blessings with our grandchildren. And you know, we Americans confuse all that, don't we? Because here's what we can think. Well, of course, I'm just telling you right now, I am blessed by God. Look at that car the Lord blessed me with. Well, that may be true. Maybe God did bless you with that car. Did you know there's nothing wrong with having wealth? It's the truth. Don't have to be afraid of that. Nothing wrong with that. You'll find in the Old Testament that God himself said to the nation of Israel, he said, someday I'm going to bless you in such a way that you're going to eat food from plants you did, or, or from vineyards you didn't plant, and you're going to live in houses that you didn't build, and you're going to drink water from wells you didn't dig. In fact, he said, you're going to have so much to eat that you are absolutely full all the time. Anybody identify with that? How many of your kids say things like this? Man, I'm hungry. And the fact of the matter is, none of us have really been hungry in our entire life for the most part. Are y'all with me on that? Might as well admit it. I can tell by looking at y'all, you're eating pretty good. Help me out here. Is that right? We're good. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Those are part of God's blessings. 
God said to the nation of Israel, I'm going to be so good to you, you're going to have all kinds of stuff, and you didn't even earn it, you didn't plant it, you didn't dig it, I'm just going to bless you because I'm a good God. Materialism is part of the blessings of God. There's no doubt about that. It's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have a nice car. It's not wrong to have a nice suit. It's not, it's not, it's not wrong. But how many of y'all know that there's any number of blessings better than all of that? Did y'all know that? There's a number of blessings better. Like, like you've heard me say this. You've heard me preach many times in this pulpit. You've heard me say this, haven't you? I would love to have a Corvette. Wouldn't I look good? Red Corvette, quad exhaust, six feet on the floor, mm, leather convertible. I'm just telling you, I need one. Don't you all think? Says, what would you do with your kids? Who cares? <laughs> Bethany and I look good, wouldn't we? Now, you know this, don't you? The chances are I'll never have a Corvette. And, and if I, I, I don't really need one. I just, it's just a like. I, I plan to have a Corvette, but are you aware of this? There's any number of blessings I'd rather have than a Corvette. Any number. I, I preach this summer, and I give an illustration about a Corvette and how much I like Corvettes. And these two teenage boys pulled me aside after the service, and they were probably 14 and 15, and they were as sincere as the day is long. And they said, uh, uh, Dr. Young, can we talk to you? Well, sure, but... You can call me Dave. <laughs> and he's like, uh, okay, Brother Dave, he said, uh, can we talk to you? I said, sure. He said, we were talking about your Corvette thing, and we just made an agreement that someday we're going to make a lot of money, and we're going to buy you a Corvette. <laughs> so, so, so I'm waiting. Pray for them, all right? And uh, put that on your prayer list. Pray God will bless those boys because they made a vow before God. <laughs> and so if you ever see me driving one, no, I didn't buy it. It was two teenage boys, Okay. And uh, that's what they said. But you know, the fact of the matter is, there's a lot of blessings I'd rather have. Why, two years ago, two summers ago, got up one Saturday morning, got dressed, drove to the church, went in the church, and met my daughter, and had prayer with her. We stepped out of that prayer room and walked down the hallway and opened the back door of the church auditorium, and the music started. And I walked her down the aisle. David was on the platform waiting. I walked her down the aisle. And the music was there. And it was a beautiful crowd stood. The lights and flowers and candles. She was seven. She crawled up in my lap one day. I don't know, six or seven. Just out of the blue. Crawled up my lap. Put her hands on my face like this. And she said, Daddy, when I grow up, I'm going to marry somebody just like you. I was like, honey, you can't do any better than that. <laughs> How many dads of daughters do we have in the building? You know what I mean by that, don't you? I, I'm, I'm not trying to be weird there. It's just I'm concerned who's she going to marry. I don't want to go to jail. I've got to be careful about this. I want to be careful, I, I, but I want her to get married. I, I want her to have a good husband. And uh, there was David, the man that we had agreed, the man that, that uh, I said, uh, you can marry my daughter. With our blessing, with our love, we'll treat you like a son. You can call me dad from now on. That was a blessing I'd rather have any day than a Corvette. Y'all follow that? God wants to bless your life. And one of the great blessings God offers to me and you is victory. Try up. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies that seek him with a whole heart. Drop all the way down to verse 9 and notice this. Hey, guys, girls, teenagers, l listen to this one. Here's a verse for you. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. What the Bible says, you can have a clean life in the midst of an R-rated, perverted, godless world. If you'll get in the Bible, you can have victory in your life, no matter what this messed up world is doing. Do y'all see that tonight? Then he says in verse 10, he says, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Now there's a lesson for me and you. Are you seeking God's favor and victory and power in your life with your whole heart? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Let me not wander from thy commandments. You know the song based on that, don't you? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Y'all know those words from the old the old hymn, and then verse 11 is our verse, and I'm done. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Let's be a little elementary tonight, okay? This is a little elementary, but let's talk about this tonight. You want victory in your life? You cannot have victory in your life unless you start here. No other way. You got to get into this. You got to get into God's word. Without God's word, there's no victory in your life the way that God wants you to have it. So how y'all doing tonight? Look in the text here in verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 11, and notice in verse 11, there's truth, there's time, and there's triumph. The truth, there it is right there, first, verse 11, first two words, thy word. How many of y'all believe the Bible is true? It's theological, isn't it? That's theological, it's truth, thy word is true. It's a theological side, thy word is true. It's inspired. It was given to us by God as his spirit guided men and, and their writing. It was preserved. God kept it available in every generation. It was given so precisely that every time it is accurately translated, it is the very words of Almighty God himself. Is that not an incredible thought to think about? It's God's word. It's true. You believe that, don't you? There's theology in those two words, thy word. There's theology there. And I would say to you, there's something practical there. Remember, Jesus said, they shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Notice how practical that is. Free from what? Free from this world and all of its hang-ups and its problems and its mess. Free from my background and my personality issues and my worry and my fussing and my grouch. Free from all the effects of living in a sin-cursed world. There's a God in heaven that gave you his word so that through his word, you can have triumph in your life. And here's how he outlines it. If you wanted to look at it like this, in these verses, he lets us know that through God's word, we can be undefiled in our way. We can be blessed in our work. We can be clean in our walk. We can be rescued from our wandering. And we can be armed for the war that we're facing in our generation. It's the word of God, and it's practical. But then I hasten to tell you, not only is there truth here, there's time here. Now, you say, where'd you get that? Watch this. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Here's a, here's a question. How long does that take? How long does it take to hide God's word in my heart? What's the word hide mean? Thy word have I hid. What's that word hid mean? It's a simple word, but a powerful word. It means your word, God, have I treasured or put on reserve. I like to say it like this. I took your word, God, and I put it in the reference library of my life. Your word. I've been getting to know your word. I've been hiding it. That word hid. I'm treasuring it. I'm reserving it. I'm putting it on uh, in, in the reference library of my life. So I know I'm going to need your word. And, and when I need your word, I want your word to be right there in my heart. That's the second word. The word hid, treasured, reserved, placed in the reference library. The word heart, you know, is that big word. It's, um, it's a hard word to define. You know that, right? How do you define the word heart in the Bible? It's a big word. But really, you can simplify it down to where the heart is a Bible word that refers to the sum total of our thoughts, our emotions, and our decisions. We are thoughts, emotions, and decision. A life is made up by our thoughts, our emotions, and our decisions. When the Bible says, thy word have I hid in my heart, apply that. God, I've taken your word, and I've gotten to know it, and I'm reading it every day, and I love your word, and I'm teaching it to my children, and I'm trying to get to know your word and applying it to my life so that your word governs my thoughts, your word controls my emotions, and your word helps me to make right decisions in my life. You know what happens in our generation? We just live our lives. We just live our lives, and we go to church, and pay our tithe, and, and uh, give a little money to missions, and live our lives. But you know what the Bible's trying to tell you? If you're going to have victory in your life, on purpose, on purpose, you've got to get in God's Word, and it's not just a matter of reading it, but that's where it starts. You ought to read the Bible. You ought to read the Bible. And as you're reading the Bible, it's not just about, hey, praise God, I read my Bible today, and therefore, I can check that off my spiritual list. You, you ever... Now, we may not do that, but we kind of live that way. You know, praise God, I read three chapters a day. Check mark. 
Praise God, I'm just feeling pretty good about myself because I, uh, I just did my little spiritual to-do list. Did you know God's not interested in you having a spiritual to-do list? God is interested in his word being so real in your life that it controls your thoughts. God is interested in his word being so real in your life that it governs your emotions. You, you heard somebody say this, you know, I just, um, I just battle depression. I don't mean this to be mean. But if you're a child of God, there's a better way to live. I don't mean this to be mean. I'm not minimizing challenges of life. I'm not minimizing the negative effects of living in a sin-cursed world. I'm aware of them. I counsel them all the time, and I experience them in my own life. But brothers and sisters, revival is when I say, you know what? I, I've, I've battled this depression long enough, and I'm going to get in God's Word and allow God's Word to govern my thoughts so that I am thinking that which is right. You know what I mean by that? Philippians 4.8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, lovely, pure, of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think about that. Think on these things. As he thinketh in his heart, what does your Bible say? So is he. So why, why are we living our lives defeated, depressed, discouraged, full of worry, frustration, irritation? Why are we living that way? You got a Bible. You're to take God's word and get to know God's word in such a way that your thoughts are governed by the Bible. Say, how does that work? Talk to yourself. It's okay. You know that, right? It's okay. John Rice said, some of you know that name. John Rice said, I talk to myself. He said, I like to hear what a wise man has to say. I think he was joking, but maybe he wasn't. I don't know. I, I never knew him. I just read that he had said that. And, uh, and yet the psalmist David talked to himself. You've read that, haven't you? David said one day to himself, he said, uh, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why, why, art thou, why is thy, my heart disquieted within me? What's David saying to himself? Here, here's what he said. David, what is wrong with you? You're acting like God is no longer on the throne of your life. Like God's hands are tied. How am I going to get to the throne? I'm running from Saul, and I'm down, and I'm discouraged, and I'm defeated. What is wrong with you, David? He talked to himself, the word of God. And he answered himself. Here's what he said. He said, David, for, and I'm paraphrasing, David, for crying out loud, hope thou in God. You know what he's doing? He's taking steps toward victory by getting into God's word and talking God's word into his heart, into his mind, into his emotions, and into his decisions. How long has it been since God's word was that real in your life? You said, you know what? I battle worry, and I'm tired of being a worrier. So I'm going to get in God's word. Remind myself that Almighty God is on the throne of the universe and that he's in charge of my life and that I can trust him, that he is a good God, that he's working the details of my life together for his good and for my good, for his glory and for my good. I can trust God and God, you got to help me to take your word and apply it to my life. You got to get God's word in your life. No wonder we're so defeated. We're so busy. We have no time to apply God's word to our life. It's got to be in your heart. It's how you have victory. In your thoughts, you got to think it. You got to live it. You got to feel it. Govern your emotions by the Bible. We all battle them, don't we? Do you ever battle with emotions? Sure, we're emotional people designed by God. That's no way to live, though, defeated by emotions. We're to control our emotions from the Bible. And think about, think about all the fact some of you carry so much baggage around with you, don't you? Your past, some of you carry it with you. You carry your past with you. You're where you go. There's something happened, the way you were raised, the struggles of your youth, your besetting sin, your defeat. Your, you carry it with you everywhere you go, and it affects you. It spills out, doesn't it? Somebody cuts you off in traffic, and the next thing you know, you have ruined your day. It just spills out of you, that, that old nature just spills out. Sometimes, sometimes when we are carrying our past with us and our sins with us and our struggles with us and our defeats with us and our frustrations with us, uh, why, somebody can say a little something or bother us, rub us the wrong way, and the next thing you know, I say this gently, we vomit our Adamic nature all over everything. You've been there, haven't you? But see, that's not victory. 
victory's unbothered. It's not to say life's not hard. It's not to say I have difficulties. It just says, you know what? I'm going to deal with these things in my life, and I'm going to replace them by the truth of God's word. And instead of carrying my bitterness, instead of carrying my problem, instead of carrying my personality issues, instead of carrying everywhere I go all the issues I've battled and my besetting sin and my defeats and my discouragement, instead of carrying all that with me, I'm going to clean that out of my life, and I'm going to put God's word, and I'm going to start carrying God's word with me everywhere I go. And when somebody cuts me off in traffic, I'm just going to be controlled by the word of God. God, and I'm just going to be able to say, praise God, come on in. What a beautiful day. God bless you. I'll be behind you at the next traffic light. <laughs> so isn't that how it works? We get so bent out of shape about life's issues, and some are a lot bigger than getting cut off in traffic, aren't they? And God knows that. And church, if you're going to have victory in your life, you've got to come to the place where you say, okay, God, what does your word say about my issues and my background in my past, I'm going to put your word in my life, and I'm going to take it with me so I can have victory in my life. How many of y'all know that's a time factor? It's like dieting. How many ever dieted? How many of y'all just praise God for a good diet? I mean, isn't that just like, wow. If you're ever going to lose weight, how do you do it? Time. It's a whole lot, it's a whole lot easier to keep it off than it is to take it off. Give me an amen right there. Because of all the time. It's like, it's like, like working out. Well, you start working out, hey, you're hurt, you're sore, but if you work out enough, if you do enough push-ups, if you do enough sit-ups, if you keep working out, eventually it gets easier. Time involved. Dieting, running. Anybody runner? Any runners in the building? Any runners here? Running, running is, is you know, running something you can do, but most of you don't do it because it takes, it takes time. See, life is time. Spirituality is time. How long has it been since you sat down and said, all right, all right, Lord, what do I need to work on? Okay, Lord, how could I have more victory in my life, more joy, more peace, more love, be a better soul winner? How many of y'all agree? It starts. I got to start reading the Word of God. Let's just start right there. I'm almost done. Let's just start right there. It's a revival meeting. How long has it been since you read God's Word on a daily basis? And let's just say tonight, well, if you haven't, let's start revival right there. And I'm just going to say to you here in a moment when I give the invitation, if it's been a long time since you read God's Word on a daily basis, then you ought to walk down an aisle tonight in a Sunday night revival and kneel and say, okay, Lord, you help me, and I'll start there. It's fair enough? How long has it been since you taught your kids the Bible? You do know, don't you? There's not enough money in Christian education to overcome the failure of a Christian home. Did you know that, brothers and sisters? Starts with your home. I thank God for Christian education, don't you all? But the home's where it all starts. Daddies, you don't have to have a revival meeting in your home. When's the last time you taught your kids Bible truth? Made it a part of your life. Why, Thomas, or the, rather Moses, told the nation of Israel in Deuteronomy, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Start with you. Get in God's word yourself, Dad. Get in God's word yourself, Mom. Get in God's word yourself, children. Every child of God ought to be in the Bible. Let's start there. These words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. And then he said, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Well, talk about them when you're sitting in your house. Talk about them when you're going to bed. Talk about them when you're getting out of bed. Talk about them when you're walking through life. You can have, you can have, okay, let's have devotions. We're going to sit down. We're going to take God's word. We're going to read something in the Bible. We're going to memorize something together. We're going to apply it to our life. That is valid. Y'all with me on that? That is valid. But can I tell you something? Here's what Paul, or what rather Moses said you ought to do. He said, when you're sitting in your house, talk about the Bible. When you're going to bed, just talk about the Bible. When you're walking through life, just talk about the Bible. When you're getting out of bed, just talk about the Bible. When you're watching television, Y'all do that sometimes, don't you? When you're watching television, you're sitting in your house and you're watching Andy Griffith because you're a fundamental Baptist and, and Andy Griffith is good and clean and, and you're sitting there with your kids watching Andy Griffith and trying to be conservative and, uh, and, and, and a good, good dad and mom watching Andy Griffith and the next thing you know, the, the, the jail door opens and Otis stumbles in drunk locks himself in jail. 
you know, that's just how it always works. Drunks always lock themselves up so they don't hurt anybody, run over anybody, abuse anybody, right? That's how it works. It's true to life. Andy had that one right, didn't he? No, he didn't. Time for devotions. Hey, kids. That's funny right there, wasn't it? But don't ever forget, kids, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Don't be a fool about alcohol. It'll ruin your life. But just had devotions. You're driving through town, there's a billboard. Godless, inappropriate, unwise, maybe just downright wicked. Be a good time for devotion. Flee youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Have a devotion while you're walking through life. My dad sat me or stood me one time in a cornfield. I was just a little guy, and I have this problem. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. Anybody here like that? I mean, you kind of identify with that. I like my shirts, my white ones together, my blue ones together. I, I like my socks organized by color. I, it's just how God made me, all right? So don't make fun of me. And, and I, I like it. I like it that way. And then God gave me five kids and kind of messed up my world. When I was a little boy, I stood in a cornfield one day. You ever been in a cornfield? Parallel rows of little corn shoots. Parallel rows. It was beautiful. Just parallel, all these parallel roads. It was just beautiful. My little, my little heart was like, oh, wow. That's just beautiful. And I don't remember all of us. I said to my dad, I mean, isn't that beautiful? I, my dad, kind of out of character, my dad was like, yeah, it is, son. He said what the Bible says. My dad never quoted the Bible to us. But I remember he did that time. Remember what the Bible says, son? The Bible says, you reap what you sow. He said, boy, we did a lot of work in this field. We spent a lot of money on this field. We did the disking, we did the plowing, and we did the planting, and we did the spray. Man, we did a lot of work there. And what you need to know, son, is that you reap what you sow. And then my dad reached over, kind of touched me on the shoulder, and he said, you be careful what you plant in your life because it'll come up. We had devotions in a cornfield. See, you don't, have to, you don't have to be, I'm super Christian and our family will stop every night and we're going to read 23 chapters in the Bible standing to our feet as we do. You don't have to be weird about it. But you can't have victory without God's word. In your life, in your home, you need help. And what happens if I do it? Thy word, truth, have I hid in my heart time, Why? that I might not sin against thee. Triumph. Do you see the connection? So here's what God says about me and you. God says, uh, Paul says this about, about me and you. He said, now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Brothers and sisters, it's not automatic. You and I have to get in God's word and on purpose grow spiritually and take God's word and overcome the issues of our life and our struggles and our past and our decisions. We've got we've to take God's word and live it and love it and learn it and apply it. Because you know why? It can bring victory to your life and to your children. And that's God's plan. Be honest. Is this message not kind of elementary? It's not like we're sitting here going, wow, I have never heard that before. And yet, isn't it also true in our busy world? Isn't it also true in the issues of our lives? We can allow God's word to become second nature instead of alive and real and applied. Am I right or wrong? So let's start there and have revival. How many of you would kneel tonight and say, God, I'm going to start reading your word every day again? Maybe you never have, and you'll say, God, I'm going to start. And how many dads and moms would say, you know, we are busy, and life is so crazy busy, but we're going to start incorporating God's word as we live our lives with our children. And uh, how many of you would say, you know, I got a specific issue in my life, and it's defeated me, and I'm going to get into God's word 
and start applying God's Word to my thoughts and my emotions and my decisions because I want victory. Brothers and sisters, you can have it. Have it made sense? All right.